for coming today to this new episode dedicated to the Peruvian history and South American history. Thank you so much for joining to this virtual live event. My name is Vanessa Vasquez and I am your Lima City tour guide. If you're watching this event recorded already, I do live events once a week here on YouTube. So also all your recommendations for upcoming events are highly, highly appreciated. Hola, hola, Marilyn. Thanks for coming. Hola, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Today we're going to talk about the conquest of Peru and the Tahuantinsuyo. So it's going to be an event dedicated to the discovery of, of this territory by the Spanish. Of course, that uh, words like discovery, conquest and invasion are uh, always uh, hot topics no? for, for many specialists and, and many people. Uh, so it's not very easy to come to a conclusion on which word should be used or should not be used. And today we're going to talk about this. Uh, should we talk about, should we talk about the conquest or the invasion of the Tawantinsuyo? Mm -hmm. My pleasure to have you today. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Marilyn. So, well, before we begin, I would like to say some few words about, uh, well, our, this event and also myself. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am your Lima City tour guide. Uh, I love to talk about history, comment history, discuss historic events, especially the ones that I refer to as untold history of Peru. Um, this is definitely not an untold history because most people around the world knows about um, the expansion of the Europeans towards the Americas. Um, you might not know all of the details of the story, but probably you understand that the Spanish conquer big part of the Americas uh, for a, well, a long period of time. They conquer, they create, they settle uh, their, their cities here, their ways of seeing the world, their religion, and also we are the consequence, the modern people of these territories, we are the consequence of, of, of that, of that clash of cultures, of that forced marriage in some cases also. We can definitely refer to as a forced marriage between two worlds because um, neither one or sort of like a consolidate a, a special new culture, you know, from both influences, no? They were, they were trying to survive, no? Um, so, well, today we're going to talk about this chapter and I hope that I am able to answer also lots of questions that you might be having. You can also type your questions in the chat mm -hmm. section. Uh, you can see it uh, probably if you're seeing this uh, on your uh, laptop or your computer. Um, you know, there's a chat section uh, next to, to the screen or it can be also below. So whatever is, please send me your questions and let's begin with this event. So let me flip the camera to the other side. Okay. And now we're going to talk about the, um, the time uh, of the discovery uh, of the Tawantinsuyo. Um, so do you know uh, uh, the history of Peru before the arrival of the conquistadors here to this territory? If you don't know about that period of the history, I invite you to see also my other events here on, a, a, on a YouTube. I have a lot of different videos about this time a, of the history before the coming of the conquistadors. So we will basically start with this a, story oh, since the arrival of the Spanish to the Americas. Sorry that I am receiving some messages here. <laughs> Someone is trying to call me, but you know, I'm trying to disactivate the calls so I can be all focused in this event. Um, so, well, the discovery, the European discovery of the Americas is a very important event uh, in, in, in the history of this part of the world. I am not saying that it's an event to be celebrated because many people don't consider 
this event to be celebrated. Uh, basically, many people refer to commemorate uh, the discovery of the America, but not celebrate it. And, uh, and these disputes about the celebration or not have been a t hot topic until not so long ago, right? Uh, there are many monuments of Columbus uh, being removed from many cities in the Americas. Uh, but it's undeniable that this was a moment of the history in which two worlds met and the discovery of Peru, the, the conquest of the Tawantinsuyo, uh, the kingdom of the Incas, is of course connected with this moment because it's all like a, a sequence of events oh, that happened uh, until the rebel of the conquistadors here. So Christopher Columbus comes to, uh, the, to this new continent, uh, believing that it was the Indias, no? uh, that we, we were really uh, uh, the, this, the place where the spices <laughs> were awaiting for them uh, in the year 1492. Uh, that's why we are usually referred to as Indias, Indians, no? uh, Indios in Spanish. Mm? Uh, and that comes also from that time when there was a big confusion uh, uh, and, and we were believed to be the Indians. Uh. Um, so October the 12th, 1492. Um, the conquistadors come to really the, the American uh, continent a little bit later. No? So that first contact of Columbus uh, with the uh, new continent was first of all by the islands. No? He went to the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, Columbus never comes to the mainland. Uh, he never touches uh, the continent. Um, but later on, in the year 1508, uh, the Spanish create finally cities uh, and also governorates in the American territory. Um, the first two were Castilla del Oro, where nowadays is Panama, and New Andalusia where nowadays is Colombia, part of Venezuela. Mm? Um, so the arrival of the Spanish into either the islands of the uh, Atlantic, or the Caribbean islands, or, or the continent was very, very destructive. Or it, was, it created an impact that devastated civilizations, the diseases of the Spanish also. This is very well known, were spread all over. Um, but also, we're going to see today the reasons why the Spanish and how the Spanish justify their presence in these territories. So which ones were the reasons uh, that they used to legitimize their presence here? Okay. Um, so in this part of the history also uh, of, of the Americas, uh, we have a very important character that was already here in this territory uh, in this period that later became the conquistador uh, of Peru, Francisco Pizarro. Mm -hmm. Francisco Pizarro, he's already participating, for example, in the creation of the 14th of San Sebastián, uh, which is usually referred to as the first city in the American continent. Um, well, it was not a city per se. It was a fortin, it was a bastion, a place of, a fortress, a place of defense. So it was never really a city. Mm -hmm. um, but well, it, it was a very important place because it was the first location where the Spanish uh, tried to create uh, a settlement. Uh, also another important person uh, that was involved in the creation of that first fortress, I'm, military Spanish fortress was Vasco Núñez de Balboa. You are going to also hear about him a little bit later. Oh. So um, conquistadors like Francisco Pizarro or Balboa, uh, also uh, Hernán Cortés in Mexico, were characters who were coming from Spain. Most of them were not uh, of wealth. Oh. They made their wealth here oh, in the Americas. Uh, and Francisco Pizarro himself, we will also talk about him a little bit later. Uh, his history is very, very interesting. 
No? He was not a, play, a person of wealth or a person of status. He came to the Americas to make a fortune, right? Um, so, well, they were coming here uh, basically because they didn't have opportunities back home uh, where they come from. Of course, that there was a group of Hidalgos, of wealth, or wealthy men, who were the ones who were given the uh, sort of like the, the priorities no? to, uh, go, to become the governors, no? to become the leaders or the rulers. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if you hear some noises. I don't know what happens with my neighbors. <laughs> they are moving uh, things next door. <laughs> so I hope you're not able to hear all of that. But if you are, I'm so sorry. By the way, let me, let me know if you are hearing me, if you're able to, uh, let's say, to, to hear my voice, to see the video with no problem. I know that I have some people connected, so that would be super fantastic if I know if you're able to, to see everything and to hear everything, right? You can just comment here in the chat. Um, so, well, uh, now we're going to continue also. Um, so. Talking about this, the first cities, the first settled, uh, created uh, like zones for the Spanish to live in the in the continent. Uh, all good. Oh, thank you, Colleen. Muchas gracias. <laughs> there are noises. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Marilyn. I, I don't know what happens exactly at this time. Every time I I try to do an event, there is something happening about the noise. <laughs> Doesn't matter. The rest of the day is very quiet, <laughs> but it's just in this moment. Okay. Um, well, let's go back to our our theme. So um, the first city that the Spanish established in the continent uh, was named Santa Maria la Antigua, and it is uh, located. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore as a city, but the remains, the archaeological remains of that city. Uh, are located where nowadays is Panama, in Panama's territory, right? Um, a curiosity about that city uh, that was established in the year 1510 uh, is that it just lasted for 15 years. Uh, so it didn't last it long. Mm. Uh, later, it was moved to another location, uh, but the city was kind of lost, uh, like, mm, well, people didn't have a, a knowledge of the exact location of that city until 2019. Hmm? Um, so, Santa Maria, oh, which you can see also here in this, in this map. Santa Maria is a very good starting point uh, to understand the conquest of the Tahuantinsuyo, even though we're talking about a very, very distant land from what nowadays is Peru. And that is because we know for sure that after the fortress of San Sebastian, uh, Pizarro moved to Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that later after, uh, he took part of... Hola, Marilu. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for joining. I'm doing good. Just a little bit of background, background sound <laughs> from my neighbors, but everything is okay here. <laughs> um, so. I was saying that Francisco Pizarro took part of the expedition of Vasco Núñez de Balboa. This is the other person I was referring to um, that also participated of the, of the defense of the fortress of San Sebastian, right? Um, so this man, uh, uh, Vasco Núñez de Balboa, uh, had a, a very uh, interesting sort of like plan, a, a, a wish uh, also, uh, as a conquistador he was, uh, he wanted to see uh, um, if there was a, a city of gold uh, in, in that territory, because they hear that there were uh, like stories of golden cities uh, when they arrived to mainland or, or tierra firme. That's the way also how we originally refer to that territory, firm land. Uh, will be the most literal translation of terra firme, also uh, uh, firm land, uh, that's another way to say it. Um, so they started to hear stories from the indigenous that uh, there were cities of gold, right? 
Uh, but all of them said like far away, you know, in the distance. <laughs> you know? So um, Vasco Núñez de Balboa uh, hear these stories and he says, well, we, we have to do something. We have to go to, to see if there is a city of gold. And he creates an expedition. Right? Uh, his expedition never took him to a golden city, but um, he was able to discover something even more interesting for, for the Europeans. These are, by the way, discoveries for the Europeans. No? There were already people here that knew all of this that I'm saying, uh, but these were discoveries that the Europeans were doing uh, on, their, on their way uh, to, to find more. No? Uh, so he discovered the Pacific. Right? Uh, so this is the way how he went uh, from Santa Maria uh, to other cities like Areta, San Miguel, uh, Tumaco, and that's the moment when he sees uh, the uh, Pacific. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the year 1513. Who was part of that expedition? Remember, Francisco Pizarro. Okay. Um, so Vasco Núñez de Balboa, he named uh, this new sea he discovered Mar del Sur. Mar del Sur. Why? Well, if we go back, so his perspective of the sea was that it was in the south. Uh, he was not seeing the oeste, the west, he was seeing the south, right? So that's why he named this sea the Sea of the South, Mar del Sur, right? Um, so he discovered the Mar del Sur on September 29, 1513, okay? Um, so why we name uh, Pacific our ocean and not Mar del Sur? Mm? Well, of course, it is not logical to name Mar del Sur, the Sea of the South, the Pacific that is so big. <laughs> but um, it is also because the name Pacific uh, it was coined by another person who's, you know, like um, whose trip or uh, whose, we say, hazaña in Spanish, you know, his, his incredible achievement. Uh, um, also made him to be more memorable and be more also remembered uh, in history books. Um, so, Fernando de Magallanes, or Magellan, uh, his trip of circumnavigation around planet Earth uh, that started in the year 1519, the, the journey ended in 1522 without him. Uh, he died in Philippines. Uh, uh, due to an attack of, of indigenous. So he was not able to conclude his own expedition. But um, the moment when Magellan was able to cross the very harsh seas of the Atlantic uh, in the south of, uh, of, of the continent, uh, between Argentina and Chile, the moment when both two seas encounter, the one of the Pacific uh, and the one of the Atlantic, so in the moment when he was finishing uh, the, the, the segment of the Atlantic and getting into the Pacific, he realized that the waters in the Pacific side were very calm. So that's why he named uh, that sea Pacifico, because it was Pacific. Mm -hmm. And that's why we use that name also nowadays. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also something very curious about this circumnavigation uh, trip. Uh, this circumnavigation proved uh, to the Spanish that um, this trip of circumnavigation around the world for spices from Spain and then back to Spain was unfeasible. Uh, it was very dangerous, very risky, and very expensive. So it didn't work, right? So. Well, now the Spanish realize that, well, they cannot use, you know, like uh, their, their ships uh, uh, to go to the spices in that direction, right? They cannot use this continent uh, as, a, as a way of, you know, connection uh, to the spices because the trips were way too long, way too far. 
in a way too distant uh, and dangerous. So, well, they, they said, well, we will not obtain spices from here, but we have to make a fortune in a different way. Oh, so that's how also the Spanish focus more in the gold, in the silver, in the wealth of the land, the wealth of the soil. Hmm? And they dismiss those ideas of spices, right? Um, so he was seeing uh, recreation of another city. Mm -hmm. um, well, the city of Panama, the first city of Panama, uh, that was established also looking to the Pacific, um, was the place where Francisco Pizarro also became a very respectable man, uh, a, a man of high status. Mm -hmm. So from the years 1519 to 1523, Pizarro becomes a very important person, a mayor uh, of the city of Panama, a magistrate, uh, even an encomendero. An encomendero means a person that has under his custody a big extent of land. Mm -hmm. So he was a, a very powerful person. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, Pizarro, no? who was Pizarro? So from what I'm saying, probably you have the impression that he was a big Hidalgo, a very important, wealthy man that was able to access to the highest status you know, in these uh, civilizatory, in a way, campaigns and conquest campaigns in the, in the American, in the Spanish Americas. You know? um, but Pizarro's origins distant, are very distant from, from this image we might have of him. Francisco Pizarro González was born in Trujillo, Extremadura, Spain. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty much the central zone of Spain. In a land that was very harsh, very, very tough uh, in, the, in the times we're talking about the 15th, 17th, 15th, 16th century. No? Um, Pizarro was not a man of wealth from birth. Although his father, Gonzalo Pizarro, uh, was a very rich man. He was a wealthy Hidalgo of high status. Uh, in the documents of his time, he's referred as a Don, Don Gonzalo Pizarro. Uh, nowadays in Spanish, we use Don to refer to any gentleman that is our senior, right? Don Juan, Don Pedro, no? Uh, but in those days, not everybody could be called Don. Oh, that was a sign of a status. Oh. Uh, so this man mm, uh, had many children, many children that were not legitimate. Mm. Uh, he had also legitimate children. Mm. Uh, and his oldest child was Francisco Pizarro. Uh, there are very interesting curiosities about the relation between uh, Pizarro and his father. Mm. Uh, we know that Francisco Pizarro was welcome in the house of his father, uh, but there is a very interesting thing about, for example, the last will of Gonzalo Pizarro, oh, we, we name in Spanish this will Testamento, um, in which all of his children are mentioned with the only exception of Francisco Pizarro, which was for those days the most famous of the children he had, right? And remember, he even mentioned in his last will all of his illegitimate children. Pizarro was, Francisco Pizarro was the only one not mentioned. Why? There are many theories, oh, many, many theories. Oh, some say that probably Gonzalo Pizarro was not actually the father of Francisco Pizarro, or that maybe was uh, uh, the uncle of Francisco Pizarro, right? Uh, but there is one interesting story, interesting theory that I like to share always, and it's related with the mother of Francisco Pizarro, Francisca Gonzalez. Uh, this theory says that there is a possibility that Francisca Gonzalez was, a, well, a, a crypto Jew, that she was Jewish and uh, her relation, her connections with the Jewish community uh, made Gonzalo Pizarro a little bit worried. So he didn't want it to be too connected with that family and therefore with his own child. Mm -hmm. 
um, Francisca P. Gonzalez is referred to as Portuguese, which in those days also could be someone that was uh, Jewish. No? And also she was referred to as La Trapera or the Ropera, which means that she sold clothes and she belonged to a family that used to be in that business, which was almost exclusively a business for uh, the Jewish community. Anyways, um, I have a tour dedicated to the secret Jewish community of Lima of the colonial days and even a video about it. If you want to see it, it is already posted here in YouTube. Um, so, uh, Pizarro comes to the Americas, by the way, in the year 1502, okay? Well, so now you know a bit about Francisco Pizarro. Oh, by the way, we know that he was cousin of Hernán Cortés, the, uh, the discoverer uh, and conquistador of Mexico. No? Um, so he, he was connected by blood with that man. Um, so well, now we're going to talk about the three partners of the conquest of Peru. Mm -hmm. um, and these are characters that we know in Peru since the school days, of course. This are the first historic characters we know when we learn about the history of the uh, Spanish invasion to our territory. Um, and let me also refer by name each one of them. We have over here Francisco Pizarro. By the way, guys, I would like to know if you are able to see me Oh, because I think there I have lost connection for a moment. If you're able to hear me, just let me know. Please give me a thumbs up if you still hear me and see me. Uh, so please, that would be super fantastic. So I see you're back. Yes, yes. I I think I was gone for a for a minute or less. I hope. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to to what I was saying. Oh, so the three partners of the conquest. Oh. Um, so when we think about the conquest of Peru, we usually have this perception that this was a, uh, a business that was sort of like a, a, a government business no? that was uh, uh, financed by the king of Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me tell you that it was not like that. <laughs> The conquest of the Tahuantinsuyo, the conquest of this territory, was a private enterprise. Mm -hmm. It was not an estate enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it means that these people, these three men, for example, they they you know raise funds. You know, they use their own money. Uh, to pay for their soldiers, to pay for their weapons, to pay for the ship that they will be using, right? To pay for all the expenses. Mm -hmm. So how was that possible? Was that something common? Yes, it was very common in those days. Hello, hello. Are we here? <laughs> Again? <laughs> I'm here, Marilyn. Can you hear me? Please let me know if... Yes, good. Thank you, Marilyn. Gracias. Thanks for being so patient. Today, everything is happening. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so, a bit better now? Muy bien. Okay, so um, the risk uh, the Crown had to invest in every exploration uh, that someone had in mind uh, was way too high. Uh, uh, so the best way to, to conquer uh, was raising your own founds. Uh, yes, Marina, I have changed also the internet source, so I hope this gets a bit better now. Gracias. So the best way to, um, to, to found this type of businesses was, you know, you invested your own money, uh, in doing in doing this sort of like uh, enterprises, and then later, if you had proofs that what you have found it uh, was beneficial for the king, if you found you know like gold, silver, mines, I don't know something that would be of interest for the king, 
you will return to Spain with proofs of that finding and the king will then sponsor you just then right so that is the case for them so because we're, we're talking about a company we're talking about a you know like a a, a three-party company right um, what we can deduce is that each one of them of course had a role that was very clear but at the end the winnings or the earnings will be divided equally right well, yes, that's originally what they planned, uh, that the earnings will be shared. For example, Francisco Pizarro's job was being the leader of the expedition because he had also years dedicated to the, in the battlefield as a soldier, uh, so he knew how to lead. Diego de Almagro uh, was a supplier of food and weapons. Uh, his role was uh, commanding the ship uh, that they were using to be transported and he will be going back and forth to Panama bringing food, bringing weapons. Uh, so why? Why he will need to go back and forth? Well because we have to remember that back in that time there was no refrigerators, you know the food had to be fresh or relatively fresh right? and not always uh, wherever they went they will be able to have access to food or fresh water, right? Not all the indigenous that received them uh, were happy to receive them. You know? Sometimes they will not be able to have any access to food for a long time. Also, the intention of having Diego de Almagro moving back and forth from Panama was to have constant supply of food and weapons, okay? And finally, Hernando de Luque was a clergyman, he was a priest. So he was also a spiritual support for the group. But at the same time, he was, by our history, we always refer him as the person who gave the money. He had more money put in this business than the other two. Also, uh, some specialists said that he was what we call in Spanish a testaferro really uh, um, the face uh, uh, of someone behind him that was given money uh, for this business, okay? And that didn't want it to be named, mm -hmm. uh, probably because he was saving also his credibility, his reputation. Uh, he, he didn't want it to, you know, like be working there. He just wanted to give money, right? Um, so also talking about uh, Hernando de Luque, what the church made from this? What was the, the earning of the church uh, in, this, in this fight? So we see you know, uh, priests coming to the Americas very early in, in the history of the conquest. Well, uh, the church was also fighting, was a, in a, a spiritual, in, in a way to say, a fight in Europe. And they needed as much as the soldiers this new territory oh, and the reason is because uh, these times also coincide with the um, well the 95 pieces of Martin Luther oh, that were published in the year 1517 and the raising of the Protestant Church in Europe oh. so the church the Catholic Church needed new believers oh, needed uh, people oh, souls to be saved Mm -hmm. um, in Europe, there was this ideological dispute of, you know, how the church should behave, you know, what was the role of the church. Uh, but in the new world, well, there was no ideological fight. They completely not considered the religions of the indigenous. No? They were, those were pagan religions that they had to be erased. That's why also the Spanish were so, uh, how to say it? Uh, jealous with the Americas, the Hispanic Americas, because they didn't want Protestants to come, Jews to come, more Muslims to come, because they didn't want it to have competition. Uh, like the indigenous should just receive the Catholic faith as the only one, right? Um, so when the Spanish came uh, to, to these territories, um, like things were not really that easy and they were not just from one day to another. 
Uh, eh, you know that we had the, the Incan Tahuantinsuyo, oh, which was the kingdom of the, of the Incas. Eh, the Tahuantinsuyo, or the, the land of the four parts, uh, that would be the translation of that name in Spanish and English, uh, the four parts kingdom, um, was very large. We know that the Tahuantinsuyo, the, the territory was as big as, well, nowadays it covered parts of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, right? So it was impossible to achieve such a conquest in a short time. So that's why we're going to talk about the three trips of Francisco Pizarro uh, uh, to achieve finally the conquest of this territory. Mm -hmm. um, so you know already that the company of the Levant, uh, this, this uh, union of these three uh, experienced Spanish men who were planning also to come south uh, to conquer, but to conquer what? Vanessa, what they wanted to conquer, probably you're wondering. Um, do you remember when Balboa started to listen in, in Panama, uh, uh, these stories of a golden city somewhere in the south? <laughs> Pizarro was also there. Uh, Francisco Pizarro and all of those men that were with him uh, listened from the very indigenous in Panama of this, so far, oh, like even mythical golden city, no? that nowadays we really don't know which one was. Was it the Coricancha in Cusco? Was it a lost city in the jungle? We will never know, right? Um, which city they were really referring to, right? But um, Pizarro listen to all of these stories from the indigenous. Also another thing he listens is that there are uh, societies in the South that are very advanced, that they are very good sailors also, uh, and, and they get interested in this. Um, Pizarro also was not anymore a young boy. Uh, he was a mature man of, in his 50s who wanted to achieve success. Uh, remember, he was a soldier. The only way he was able to achieve something was like fighting, right? Uh, and as he was coming to sort of like the, for those days, for this uh, time of the 16th century, the, the, the last decade probably of his life, right? Uh, he became more and more ambitious, right? Um, so, well, there are three trips that the Spanish did. Uh, uh, to finally come to the empire of the Incas. Mm -hmm. uh, these three trips were not exactly one next to the other. There was a space between them of more or less uh, one year, two years. Oh. And these trips were done with the intention basically to see what was in the South. They had no idea. Uh, the first trip, uh, which is known as the trip of the journey or the exploration uh, uh, trip. Um, this exploration, this exploratory trip, uh, took, them, took them really to see if there was something in the South. Uh, it took them from the year 1524 to 1525. Mm. Uh, once again, it was probably founded. 80 men on one ship departed from Panama uh, um, southwards. Mm. And to be very honest, uh, they didn't discover anything, anything like new or great uh, in that trip. You can see here, for example, uh, this section here is the first trip, right? So such a long time also for, you know, for a quite a small territory. But uh, they were also disembarking in, in many, many different locations. They were trying to contact the indigenous. They brought with them also indigenous men from Panama uh, that learn Spanish as interpreters. Um, and I think also worse things happened to them than what they could imagine. For example, in, in this trip, Pizarro almost lost his life in a place por, uh, named uh, Puerto Quemado, uh, nowadays Colombian territory. Quemado means burned, and that's because the Spanish burned it all. Uh, and they named it Puerto Quemado, the burned port. Also, 
uh, Burn City, oh, it's another name given to this place. And also, uh, Diego de Almagro lost one eye oh, in this expedition, right? Um, so, well, there was, this was a, a terrible trip for them. Um, if they actually follow well what the experience was, and most of them, you know, their, their, their feelings in their heart was like there was nothing there, probably the conquest to the Tawantinsuyo would be delayed for many more years. We don't know what will happen, right? But Pizarro, remember, he was against the clock. Oh, so he, he needed to achieve success, a great success, right? So uh, the sort of like uh, the resulting of this exploration journey, uh, exploration trip, uh, was that basically was a failure. Uh, it was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, they lost a third of their expedition. They had no money. They didn't make any money. No gold found it. They returned to Panama. So um, in Panama, back in Panama, there is also arguments, fights between Almagro, Pizarro, Luque. Uh, well, they don't know if continue going for a second trip. Pizarro convinced them uh, uh, to go for this second trip. Mm -hmm. um, so the second trip started in the year 1526. And in this occasion, they are able to come with bigger number of people, uh, like uh, 180 men. And also they correct a mistake done before. Uh, using one ship was not a very good idea because remember that Almagro, uh, was in charge of bringing goods back and forth from Panama. So that meant that for moments, the expedition had to be divided and, and one group had to be in land or in islands also left uh, until Almagro returned with the goods from Panama. That could take a long time, right? So in this occasion, there were two ships. Oh, so it would be easy if it was needed a return from, this, from the group that was staying. Right, um, but also still a lot of terrible things happen. No, um, for example, there is an ambush in a city known as Atacames, no? uh, and and this city, which is well, what nowadays is Colombia, also, uh, the Spanish were like mocked. They were like a sort of like a welcome to 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 dock uh, by the indigenous that were waving hands to them, that were showing food for them to come. So the Spanish said, oh, they might be welcoming to us. They, they might be welcoming us no, into the city. They want to be friendly, so let's go. So they went uh, to, the, to the city of Atacames and they were attacked uh, by the indigenous. They were throw stones and arrows. Uh, so it was a disaster also. Well, um, so there were also many occasions in which the Spanish, you know, were asking, you know, to Pizarro, who was the captain, to return to Panama. Um, and finally, uh, the, the worst uh, comes, right? Um, which is basically that people start to stand against uh, Pizarro. Um, and it happens also in an island uh, that is called... Uh, the Isla del Gallo, mm, uh, also located where nowadays is uh, Colombia. Oh, and in that island, uh, Pizarro marks a land, uh, line sorry, in the floor, in the soil, and asks to those men who want to return to Panama to stay where they were, right? To, if they want to go to Panama to be poor, and those who wanted to go or uh, to this new land, to Peru, or uh, to this new land, to be rich, to cross the land and go on his side. Uh, and from this big number of people, remember that 180 men uh, left Panama uh, to go to this expedition with Pizarro. You know how many people crossed the line? 13 soldiers crossed the line. Right? And uh, well, the ones who stand it, uh, next to Pizarro, they are remembered as the 13 of the fame, Los Trece de la Fama. Hmm? Um, so in, in the meantime, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the supporter of Pizarro uh, 
returns to Panama. He takes long time to return, seven months to return. <laughs> Almagro, oh, like had problems to return with the with the goods, with the food, right? He return. He doesn't return by, by the way himself. He sends another person by with the ship uh, to pick up the Spanish, right? And um, also there were these decisions done by the governor of Panama that the expedition should be canceled, right? So Pizarro finds his way to stay, hmm? maybe paying money uh, to the person that was coming to pick him up, uh, and he waits uh, later for more people to join him. He stays there, uh, he's picked up, then later he continues doing some expeditions also. He visits cities uh, in the north of Peru that he finally sees. Uh, finally sees an Incan city in the north of Peru in the second expedition. Uh, he meets the Tayanes natives and he picks up three young boys, indigenous, from this territory that spoke Quechua uh, as well as their own indigenous language. Felipillo, Fernandillo and Francisquillo. Right? They were, those were the Christian names given to them. Um, so he picked them up, uh, he took them, uh, and he taught them Spanish, okay? So that is the end of this second expedition. And by the way, I would like to share with you also uh, the image of the first coat of arm of Tumbes. Tumbes is a, a beautiful city in the north of the country. The story says that that first city the Spanish saw in Peru was covered in gold, covered uh, in, in, in precious metals. Uh, it was a fortress, right? And there's no drawing made by the Spanish of that first encountering, but later the Spanish who saw that city, uh, they describe it and the coat of arm was done. Uh, uh, so this coat of arm shows the fortress, for example, that they describe they saw, the Temple of the Sun, also uh, Inca trails, uh, the port of Tumbes, so all was described uh, there and included in the first coat of arm of Tumbes. So the conclusion of this trip is that it was a success, number one, and there was a golden kingdom uh, in the south. Finally, they were able to see it. So finally, the third trip, the third trip uh, took these uh, men, uh, not just to the Incan territory, but also uh, they took them uh, to meet uh, Atahualpa. Uh, uh, so this is the trip of the invasion, okay? The trip of the invasion. Mm? Uh, and well, Pizarro reaches this territory in the year 1531. So there is a longer space between 1527 and 31, and, and why he took so long? Because maybe you remember that he had these three young boys, right, uh, that he also used not just as interpreters, uh, but also before using them as, an, as interpreters, he took them with him to Spain, uh, and he took also different objects that he was able to recollect from that second trip in, in Tumbes, uh, proofs for uh, showing the king of Spain that uh, this mission was not just doable and possible, but also that will be beneficial uh, for the kingdom of Spain. Um, he was not able to have an interview with the very king, but he had good connections enough to, to be able to be received by people of the court. And finally, his journey was accepted. No? The third expedition uh, was having the permission of the king. And um, it was done a capitulation also for, for this purpose, which was uh, this permission for him to conquer. But here we see another side of Pizarro that I think is important for you to know. Uh, let's go back to the idea of the um, this, this, this company created by these three men, oh, uh, 
Almagro, Luque, Pizarro, right? So it was supposed to be a company in which three people participated and they equally would receive the three, you know, like wealth. Well, there is a problem, okay? So probably there was no contract between them. And also there were some actions done by, for example, Almagro. Almagro not returning on time to pick up Pizarro in the second trip, right? Uh, or, or the fact that Pizarro was exposing his life more as a soldier than the other two, right? So Pizarro thought very highly of him and, and what he was doing. Uh, and when he went and he presented in front of the king the opinion and the court, the opinion, well, that uh, the court had from his own stories that Pizarro was saying is that he was, well, not just the captain, also he was the leader and he was the person that was founding almost alone these new, these adventures. So Pizarro receives a very, very big salary from the king of Spain, right? He receives also the title of captain, right? And he becomes also marquis. Oh, so he becomes nobility. And you know what happened with the other two? <laughs> oh, so Almagro receives the title of mayor of Tumbes. That's it, mayor of Tumbes. And uh, Hernan, uh, Hernando de Luque, uh, Bishop of Tumbes, and that's it. Look at the, the big difference no? from what he receives, Pizarro receives, versus his other, uh, let's say, partners, right? Um, so, well, we see also in this third trip uh, the arrival of the Spanish uh, towards uh, the territories of the Incan Empire, and of course, the meeting uh, with Atahualpa. No? Um, well, there was a civil war in Peru in that time. Oh, there were two brothers fighting, Atahualpa and Huáscar. Um, if you were not with Atahualpa, you were with, with Huáscar no? and vice versa. Uh, so when the Spanish also come to the coast, they, they take uh, uh, also their presence. is now perceived by the, by the Incas. We know by the history that a committee of Huascaristas or indigenous that were supporters of Huascar, uh, uh, let's say, came to the Spanish asking them if they were supporting Atahualpa or Huascar. And Pizarro was a very smart man. He said, of course, that he was supporting Huascar, no? <laughs> uh, so, because he, he wanted the support of the indigenous. Without the support of the indigenous, he wouldn't achieve anything, amigos, amigas. Uh, we're talking about uh, millions of indigenous versus 168 Spanish who arrived to see Atahualpa in Cajamarca. Oh, so impossible, impossible that 168 soldiers will be able to uh, defeat all of those indigenous. And in this time, they not just brought archivuses, this gunpowder, this, this guns of ga uh, activated with you know powder, gunpowder. Uh, there were soldiers, of course, that were trained. Mm -hmm. Also, they brought horses. Very important, lethal weapons. The horses, because the horses they created a, a very interesting like effect in the indigenous. The indigenous had no idea what those animals were. <laughs> they never saw something like that before. Uh, so this is a painting that represents the meeting of Pizarro and Atahualpa in Cajamarca. Uh, this is also a very curious story because Atahualpa, being the old mining king, he was very curious of the Spanish. He wanted to see them. Uh, he wanted to see if they were humans or they were supernatural creatures. His curiosity was much more powerful than his senses, uh, that his sense of survival. He was advised by his military not to present to Pizarro without the company of other soldiers. But he said, no, I want to go with hundreds of dancers and jugglers and contortionists, uh, and I want to do a show. Because this just, you know, few Spanish will never beat me. I have thousands of people around me, right? 
big mistake. Uh, what happened in the Plaza of uh, Cajamarca, uh, like when the Spanish created also they, an ambush to Atahualpa uh, that was taken like with the arms down, right? Using the gunpowder of their archivuses, creating these strong sounds, uh, like with the horses, it was, you know, like a, a sort of like a, a hysteric event uh, in which uh, people were like a, killed by themselves. They ran over the others, right? Because they had no idea what was producing these sounds. So, and it's also terrible. We know, for example, that, um, well, and this is also from the witnesses that were with Pizarro in that occasion, that the only people who didn't run were the ones who were carrying the litter where the Inca king was seated. And the ones who died you know, like uh, holding the, the litter, were immediately replaced by other people who were placed in their position. So in that way, the Inca will not fall because the Inca was a god. The Inca was the son of the sun, right? Uh, and, the, and the pope and the king all in one, right? Uh, so, well, the curiosity of Atahualpa was the reason of the decadence of Atahualpa and the decadence of the Tahuantinsuyo. Um, so he was taken prisoner, mm, uh, and, and sadly later he was he was killed. No? He was killed uh, according to the Spanish in a merciful way, uh, because the the option for someone who was not Catholic was to be burned in a stake. Um, yes, Terminator. Hi, hi. Thanks for coming, Terminator. <laughs> um, the 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 way how he should be killed as a pagan hmm, was being burned. But, uh, you know, that for the Incas, the mummies were very important. You, you had to keep your mummy if you wanted to live in, in this paradise that was the afterlife. So you can continue existing in this afterlife as long as your mummy existed. So what Atahualpa did, the moment he, he knew he would die anyway, was uh, converting into Catholicism, so in that way he will be bur uh, not burned, but he will still be killed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, uh, it was a, a terrible, terrible moment, of course, in the history of, uh, of Peru. Um, Atahualpa also was killed because he, uh, he decided to kill his brother, Huascar. Um, it's very interesting because Atahualpa's biggest fear was not the Spanish, even though he was in the hands of the Spanish. His biggest fear was always his brother, Huascar, because he was fighting for the Mascai Pacha. He was fighting for being the king of this territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so he believed the Spanish were just a face, that they would go away at some point. He even offered gold to them, and they were never satisfied with the gold. And he was also in a way so eager to create a good relation with the Spanish, and he preferred to have the Spanish on his side and not the side of Huasca. <laughs> so he offered his own sister to marry Pizarro. By the way, uh, Pizarro uh, uh, married to, to his sister. Hmm? Uh, the Spanish were here using the justification that, uh, well, they were bringing the faith, uh, the, the religion. They were here to evangelize and save the souls of the indigenous, right? But also they used another very interesting justification. They said that they were here to liberate the indigenous from the tyranny of the Inca. Okay? Doesn't matter what Inca you were believing in. <laughs> uh, so, um, of course, that they were more associated with Huascar and Inca. They never met in person. They just met Atahualpa in person. And also, an Inca dead Huascar because Huascar was killed by, or sent to be killed by Atahualpa, while Atahualpa was in imprisonment uh, in the hands of the Spanish. Uh, so, well, I think an Inca dead is like a non existent Inca, right? So, um, well, it's surprising that the Spanish were received in many cities that they arrived in the uh, Incan Empire with the open arms, right, uh, as liberators. Mm -hmm. uh, here you can see also, as we are coming to the end of this event, uh, uh, some portraits of uh, 
well, Pizarro, you know already, Francisco Pizarro, and a representation of how probably the sister of Atahualpa looked like Quispe uh, Sisa or Ines Huaylas, that was her Christian name after she became Catholic. Uh, they produced two children, only one was able to survive her parents. Francisca Pizarro is known as the first mixed blood child uh, of Peru. Mm, the, mis, the first mestiza, uh, female mixed blood. Um, so, well, this, uh, this story also of the conquest takes me at the end to this discussion, which is the last one uh, of our uh, explanation today. Conquest or invasion? No? I have used for moments one and the other. Conquest, invasion, um, they don't mean exactly the same. No? So, uh, and I am not having a position of using one or the other. Um, but let me explain why some people use conquest and why some people use invasion. Um, well, conquest refers to a, this, this type of event, these dramatic events in which you know, a group comes and takes over a land, but has the willing to uh, stay in that land, brings also their authorities to that territory and creates a, a society no, in which elements from both groups coexist at some point, right? Invasion is a complete devastation. It's a complete devastation, like with no intention of uh, allowing the, the, the groups that are being or, or existed in that zone continue, you know, like a, um, having their authorities. It's just a, a devastation uh, sweeping away, you know, what, what existed there. Um, so, of course, you are free to use conquest or invasion accordingly to what you feel or what you consider it happened in territories. Indeed, in the beginning, we definitely are talking about an invasion, but later there is an intention of creating authorities here, even also uniting with the indigenous. In the case of Pizarro, he married an Incan princess and produced heirs, mixed heirs. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, uh, historians are uh, defenders of, of different uh, positions. Um, so now we are, of course, uh, trying to use both uh, words, conquista or invasion. Mm -hmm. um, they are, as I said before, used usually as synonyms, but they are not exactly. Okay? So I hope that this event was able to give you uh, better insights about this um, event of the history of Peru. Next time, also, I want to continue exploring this topic. Uh, it would be, there would be one more uh, event dedicated to the, this period of the history of Peru. Um, also, before uh, I, I miss to say this, uh, here is the videographic resources I use uh, from YouTube. It's in Spanish. They are both, all of them in Spanish. But if you want to practice your Spanish, they are wonderful. Also, you can activate uh, Spanish uh, subtitles in, sorry, English subtitles in them. And I'm sure you're going to have an understanding of what these events say. Uh, and we'll be also uh, copying these links to the description of this video. If you see it already recorded uh, and uploaded in my uh, YouTube channel, you will be able to see these links in the description box of this video, okay? So you have a lot of um, uh, information for later and homework. And now I would like to take a moment to invite you to my upcoming events. Uh, on February the 29th, I will be cooking again for you all. We're going to have a, a very nice, very tasty uh, dish being prepared here in my house and later you can prepare it also wherever you live. It is a stuffed red peppers, Peruvian style. Uh, so please come. Uh, you don't need to be a pro, an expert <laughs> uh, cooking. I'm sure you're going to to love doing this recipe at home. This is for anyone who loves cooking. Oh, thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you, Marilu, gracias. Uh, and also for, for you, my friends, who are history buffs, history lovers. Uh, with this topic, we will be finishing also um, this period of the conquest, the fratricidal war between Atahualpa and Huascar. We talk about Huascar and Atahualpa, but well, we were not able really to understand why they were fighting, who they were. So uh, to finish with this series, 
uh, well, next time, that's going to be on March the 6th, we will talk about the Inca kings, Atahualpa and Huascar, uh, who were brothers, right? Uh, and we're going to learn their history and the reasons of their fight. Uh, um, so, well, and finally, thanks to my friends who have been supported on PayPal and also on Patreon. Gracias, Shemineto. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you can become also my Patreon here. You can see my friends who are supporting me in this beautiful PayPal, PayPal uh, sorry, Patreon community. You can also support with any donation on PayPal. Any amount is welcome. Also, that helps me a lot to continue creating events. Uh, you can support uh, anytime also. Uh, and well, you're helping me while supporting, creating more interesting events. Also, you can comment on which events you would like me to do next time, uh, uh, which themes, which uh, topics you would like me to, to comment. Um, and well, thanks a lot for being here. It took a little bit over an hour, but it is a very interesting theme. So in themes like this, when I talk for a long, long time. So well, uh, muchas gracias. Also, also before I finish, if you want to help me also in YouTube, uh, please comment this video at the end of this uh, event. Uh, you can comment it once it's uploaded. Give me a thumbs up also, that helps me a lot. And see you soon. See you in the next occasion. Uh, see you here in Lima again. Uh, have a lovely rest of the day. Bye. Take care. Ciao. Gracias. <laughs>